Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. God's love is all-encompassing. If you hook up with Jesus Christ, you will win. Your life will turn around. He's a God of 360. He never fails. He's the God of love, and love never fails. Hi, today I want to share with you uh, a message, and, and I termed it a box called pain. A box called pain. And we're going to start out with my text in Romans 8, 22 through 23. And the Bible says, we, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. You know, if you are human, at some point in your life, you will experience pain. And I have a definition of pain. Physical pain is a sensation or strong discomfort in some part of the body caused by an injury, disease, or functional disorder and transmitted through the central nervous system. The strongest physical pain known to man is not childbirth, as some people would think, but it is a sting from the bullet ant from the western rainforest. And this ant's sting is 30 times stronger than any bee. But one sting from, an, from this ant transmits a neurotoxin that goes through your entire body. And you will start shaking, then you'll start sweating, and then your heart rate goes up. And if you've had several stings, you will go in and out of consciousness, and there will be nothing in your world apart from this pain. But the second pain I'm going to talk about today in depth is emotional pain. It's pain that hurts. And, and if it's bad enough, it's difficult to forget and can even be tormenting if we let it. You know, I had an older brother uh, years ago, and his name was Ellis. And he was named after my Greek uncle, Eleftherios. And he was a quiet, gentle soul. And in my family, everyone had nicknames. And my brother's name, Ellis, was called Bum. And when he was younger, it was Bumper, and affectionately so. And he always did what was right. He always did what he was told. He never caused any trouble. And, you know, he had a few quirks about him that I remember that if he ate a tomato, he would smell it. And, but there's, there's two things that my brother absolutely loved. And that was, number one, to work. And the other one was to make money. And he had a cedar chest in his room, probably from Farley and Letcher years ago, and he, he had these blue books that were filled with old coins, pennies and dimes and silver dollars and all kinds of things. And, and he, would, he would open that chest up many times and he would admire them or he'd count them. And, and, but he loved money. And one of the things that he found out that he could do to make money was going down to A. Weiss Foundry Dump and sane brass and sell it to the junk dealers at a very young age. And there was an old guard that worked at the dump and close by, but he managed the dump and, and his name was Louis Getzinger and, and he would run everyone out of the dump because he liked to get the best hauls of the brass and, and in the neighborhood everybody was vying for those brass piles. But my brother convinced him that if he would, my brother would save all the big stuff for him, that he would let my brother have all the small stuff. So. This stuff was mixed with foundry dirt and dust and sand molds and things like that. Well, my brother hauled barrels, and I mean barrels, of brass with sand and these sand molds mixed together, and he hauled them all home. Matter of fact, uh, my dad had a scrapyard across the alley from us, and it was just filled with all of this stuff on pallets, right? Well, the next thing he did, he set up a cement mixer, and um, he plugged it in, and he would pour in those... Um, barrels of brass and, and dust, and the cement mixer would naturally sane that brass for him. And then it would go back into barrels after it was saned. Well, when my brother was only a teenager, my dad took that brass to Chicago in the early 60s, and my brother got like $3,000 for that brass. And back in the 60s, for a teenager to have $3,000, that was a lot of money back then. But there, but you know, especially for a teenager. But my brother loved to work. And my brother, while he went to high school, my dad owned a, my dad owned a rubbish business, and, and, and my brother, when he was a teenager, 16 years old, would be driving a rubbish truck. He would get home from school, and the first thing he would do is jump in the rubbish truck, 
any but empty Clark College's uh, of rubbish or any of the other accounts that needed. Nobody ever had to tell my brother what to do. He just loved to work and he wanted my dad's family business to succeed. And it was bum savings that went into the purchase of my dad's first automatic disposal rubbish truck. And my brother never asked my mom or my dad for anything. Everyone loved him. But the day came when he enlisted when he was eight year, 18 years old to go into the army. And, and the next thing we heard, he was going to Vietnam. And he was a marksman in the army. And, and while he was in Nam, they put him on these search and destroy missions. And uh, in the meantime, my dad, my dad was always a problem solver. And he came up with the idea, went to Team Electronics back then, and he purchased himself a couple of Panasonic tape players, recorders, and uh, got some cassettes. And he sent one to Vietnam to my brother and one to us. And day after day, many days, my dad would record conversations in the neighborhood and in the family, that, and, and especially the Paul Harvey news. My brother loved the Paul Harvey news because it made him feel like home. And every, every noon hour, uh, the workers would come home at noon and they would listen to the Paul Harvey news with my dad. My dad was a big news buff. And uh, so my brother could feel at home when he was away. And I remember baking cookies with my Aunt Lil and we'd pack them in oatmeal boxes uh, to ship to Vietnam because, you know, it was a bumpy ride. Um, and I remember my mom saying, well, when Bum comes home, we're going to have a block party. When Bum comes home, I'm going to buy him a new bed. And, and we just kept counting down the days when my brother would come home and kept, I'm sure, praying uh, that he would come home. But one day, I, I'll, I'll never forget this day, my mom was painting and she had her hair tied up and she was painting blocks in the ceiling in the living room. And we got a knock at the door. And I wasn't right there listening to the conversation, but I stood and I watched it. And I knew something very, very bad had happened. Um, this man come up to the door and he had said something to my mother and my mother slammed the door on him. And then she reopened it and she fell into his arms. And it was on that day that we found out that my brother was killed by a grenade. And he only had one month to go. My brother was buried on his 21st birthday to the day. It was a terrible time for our family and one that we never forgot and I distinctly remember a wooden box arriving in the mail and and walking by it time and time again. I was I was very little. I was like nine years old and thinking this must have something to do with bum. And one day my dad told my brother Philip, he said, you know, take that box and get rid of it. It's too hard on your mother. And the days and the years that preceded his death were difficult ones and nobody ever brought up his name and it was it was as if he didn't even exist and sometimes when my mom would be busy she would say his name out loud and but no one dare mention or talk about his death it was just too painful but when my mother was in her last years of her life she had a photo of bum on her dresser when he was like six or seven years old and and if you looked at that photo from the side like i did many a times you could see all her kiss marks that left an imprint on that picture of bum. Even up into her last days, she never forgot that boy. The silence was the only manifestation left of his life. And after my mother died and, and my dad was at the very end of his life, I asked my dad because I was so, you know, I, I, I couldn't remember much about him. Um, and I asked him, what was bum like? And he, he kind of broke into crying and he, and he said, all he said very profoundly, he said he was very good with his hands. You know, my dad was old, and I'm sure dementia was starting to set in. He was 94 years old when I asked him. And, and after my dad died, we printed most of Bum's letters, and we put them in a book for the family. But one day I was at my brother's house, my brother Philip, and he brought up about that box of Bum's that my dad told him to keep. He said, when should we open it up? It was 48 years later when we opened up that box that was whisked away from my grieving family. My brother Philip was so overcome with grief uh, and emotion that he couldn't look at the contents. There was a plaid shirt like Bum always wore in his wallet with photos of family and friends, a photo book of pictures we never saw before when my dad first started his business. It was really cool to look at. And his tape recorder was in there and some miscellaneous other items. 48 long years before that box was dealt with. I wish my dad was alive when we opened the box because you know what, I think it would have helped him to bring some closure to it. Well, we could have celebrated Bum's life instead of hiding the pain. The pain and the sorrow never went away because it was never dealt with. 
And, you know, I bring this up today. It's, it's a private story, but I bring it up today that I believe there's somebody out there that maybe this could help you. In all those years, the silence was deafening, yet it seemed to scream in our hearts because we never forgot Ellis, and we never will. But we couldn't talk about it either. We, we were really in a, just, it was in a bad, a bad place for all of us kids, but my parents didn't know how to go to God with things or trouble. They just, they didn't know how. They didn't know God to that extent. And they just endured the pain like so many people do. Um, but I want you to know today that we have a God that will take that pain away, that will help you to carry that pain away. And there's a God who went through it, yet overcame it, so you can too. In Isaiah 53, three through four, the Bible tells us, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And, at, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That word, it says, borne our griefs. Born means to lift, to ease, to pardon. He pardons our grief and he carries away our sorrow. That's what he does. And he did it from an old rugged cross so we don't have to carry them into eternity. Psalm 4 and 6, the Bible says, David says, There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. When my dad was dying and I was out of town, and I want to share a story with you because it impacted my life for the rest of my life. When he was dying, I was out of town, so I was driving home to see him one last time. It was like I just had to see him one last time before he died. And I needed, and I know I needed help to cope with it, with the grief of his departure, so I began to pray. And I'll never forget that prayer meeting as long as I live. I wept, I cried, I asked God for help, I prayed for my dad, you know. But it taught me something because I just poured out my heart to God. I held nothing back, and it went on for over an hour, probably an hour and 20 minutes. And it was the sweetest, sweet hour of prayer I ever had in my life. I praised him, and I, and I, I just I kept thanking him. But you know something? God did something to me because I arrived before my dad died, and my family, was all, they were all grief-stricken. And I can't tell you I was not grief-stricken. And I knew that God had done something miraculous in my heart in that car before I got there. And it happened in that sweet hour of prayer. It taught me that if I am ever overcome with grief again, I will run to God. I will run to him. I will pour out my heart because he will lift, he will lift, that, he will lift me up above the grief. He will carry my sorrows. Psalm 46 and 1, the Bible says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Hebrews 4.16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All I can say is that overwhelming grief when I came to that room was not there. It was just not there. And I thought to myself, this is odd, because I was not overcome with grief like I was just an hour and a half ago. And I really didn't realize right at the time but I realized it when I arrived at his bedside that I didn't feel and I didn't carry that grief anymore because God did a miracle in that situation. And if we could only learn to go to God in that, in that deep time of pain, he will lift it, he will carry it. I want to share to you today about a man that had a name called pain and a, and a destiny that was laden with sorrow. Um, matter of fact, his mother named him, he causes pain or sorrow. How would you like to have a destiny like that in the Old Testament? Which, when, it, when names really meant something. It's kind of like a pain in the neck or a troublemaker. There were some other things. But we don't really know why Jabez's mother called, give him that name of Jabez. He who causes pain and sorrow and trouble. She obviously had a difficult birth. She had pain, but she had pain she was not willing to forget. She had pain that she was not willing to deal with. You know, in a sense, by naming her kid, she, she kind of wanted to make a memorial out of it. You know, God doesn't want us making a memorial out of our pain. He wants us to, to build that memorial in our prayer closet like Jacob did, and God to give us power over that thing. Whatever it is, is plaguing us. But to build memorials unto God. We don't, the thing is, 
Who, who really wants a memorial pain? I don't. First Chronicles 4, 9 and 10, the Bible says, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. The word sorrow means pain bodily or mentally. How would you like to have a, that kind of identity put on you? I wouldn't. I wouldn't at all. But here we find in the midst of begats, okay, in Chronicles, um, in the fourth chapter, before and after Jabez, we find all these begats of supposedly famous men that did probably great things and just list their name and their lineage. But then it gets to Jabez. And, you know, all of a sudden we see this man whose name is called Pain. So what is the significance? But many of us um, were like Jabez. You know, really, it's really, really interesting when you realize that really he didn't even belong in that lineage at all. And, and I'll explain it. But, you know, the burden Jabez had growing up, he didn't have a great beginning. In fact, he had many disadvantages. And I'm sure I'm talking to people out there, you, you've had many disadvantages, but there is a God that can change your destiny just like he changed Jabez's. But, you know, how can you encourage a man whose name means pain? People probably snickered, they probably ostracized him, and, because who wants pain? No one. But Jabez might have grown tired of the stigmatism of his destiny, and, and he determined that the only, there is one thing I can do. I can appeal to the God of heaven to change my destiny forever. Because God can change anything and everything, because he is everything. And I personally do not believe that Jabez prayed that one little prayer. Mm -mm. I believe that he became a man with a centered, his whole life was centered around his prayer life. It was his only hope of ever rising out of the rubble of pain and despair. James 5.16, it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I believe Jabez prayed fervently. And God heard him and God delivered him. The Bible stops Judah's family history to put a spotlight on this man who causes pain. Judah was the most numerous and famous of all the tribes, yet God interrupted this account to highlight one single man. The Bible doesn't display a beginning or an end of Jabez of the, in the center of the historical recordings, but the reason is because Jab God wanted Jabez to stand out. There's something he wants us to learn from this man who was more honorable than his brethren. More honorable means kabod, the Hebrew word kabod, which means weighty, heavy in a good sense, numerous, rich, very great, glorified, prevail. He glorified God, and he also prevailed. Jabez honored God with his life and the way he lived it. And the word prevail is a Hebrew word you call, and it means to be able, to endure, overcome, have power. Sounds, I remember the, the, the prayer meeting Jacob had, and he overcame, and he, over, and he prevailed. There's a, there's a key there that we need to learn and hone in on today, the fact that we need a great prayer life. So there's always been a, a, a correlation between a great fervent prayer life and power with God. But not only that, there's also another thing called blessings. And the first thing Jabed asked for was, bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, enlarge my ability to affect people, God, to influence them for you. But Jabez, Jabez had faith, you know, in God to seek him, that God would grant him that request. And the next thing that Jabez asked God if his hand would guide him, and, and, and really the Hebrew word for hand is yod. The Hebrew word yod it means an open hand. And David in Psalm 31 and 5 says, Into thy hand I commit thy spirit. Then we go to Psalm 31 and 15. He says, my times are in your hand. So David said, my life and my times, they're, they're in your hands. God, he trusted God. And that's what we got to do today. Regardless of our situation, regardless, whatever we need, if we put, if we put our trust in God, he will not let us down. He's never let me down, not ever. When I did what I should do, he always does what he should do because he's faithful. God is faithful. One sentence of his prayer probably pleased God more than any other. And he said, God, you know, keep me from evil, that it won't grieve me. That, that again, the word evil is a Hebrew word, ra. And the essential meaning of, of this word is the inability to come to good standards 
which will benefit us. In other words, to live a good life so we can benefit from the blessings of God. We need God all the time. And Jabez not only had a name that declared him unpleasant, but he lacked the ability to be good. Is there any amens in the house? We all lack the ability to be good. We need God. The Bible says that God granted him that which he requested in Psalm 4 and 3, but know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear me when I call unto him. So God set him apart. From the moment Jabez prayed that prayer, God had it in his mind that he was going to change his destiny. He was going to change his name. God changed Jacob's name. God changed Saul's name. They had an encounter with God. So what did God change Jabez's name to? According to Aramaic Targums, which are a translation, Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible, the rabbis believe that Jabez, Jabez was a man in the Bible named Othniel. And what does the Bible say about Othniel? Um, but you know, there was a time in Israel's history they didn't drive out their enemies, so God left some of their enemies there to prove them. And we find that in Judges 3, 4, and 6, and they were, they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to, to their sons and served their gods. And in, we find in Judges 3, 9 through 11, it says, When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rish Hathayim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hands, and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rish Shathayim. And the, and the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. It actually showed that he was the first judge of Israel. What else does the scriptures tell us about him? That actually he was a Canite. He wasn't of the tribe of Judah. Here is this man right smack dab in that historical recordings. It doesn't show a mother, doesn't show a father. Why? Because he wasn't from the tribe of Israel. He was a transplant. He was a man that pleased God. And what God did, he took him out of the other nations and put him with the, with the most favored tribe that God had because his life pleased him because he called on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The fact was that they were related, he was related to Moses through marriage, not through blood lineage, but he had no privilege to be enlisted in Judah's heritage. He really didn't. He, he, he wasn't part of the family tree. You know, I'm talking to people out there, you, you don't know Christianity or you don't go to church or, or you don't feel like you know God. That's all right. God will highlight you. He'll spotlight you. He's got his spotlight on you. God wants you today, you to seek him. Find a church. Go to a church. Find someone that will teach you a, a Bible study. Call my number on the screen, 563-599-2980. Be glad to teach you a Bible study or find someone to teach you. So we know that he was a man of prayer. Judges 1, 9 through 16, through 16, and afterwards the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, that dwell in the mountain in the south and in the valley. And Judah went up against the Canaanites that dwell in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, which means city of four giants. And they slew. What they did, they slew the four giants. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir. And the name of Debir before was Kerjath Sefer. Debir is the Hebrew word for word. Sefer means scroll. The city of word or scroll. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and take it to him, will I give Aksa my daughter to wife. And Othniel, Othniel the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. She asked Caleb for a field and she lighted off from off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, what do you want? And she said unto him, give me a blessing for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also the springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the, into the wilderness of Judah with Goliath in the south of Arad. And they, and they went and dwelt among the people. We find that Jabez, uh, it, he could have gotten blessed through his wife, through Aksa. But we also found Jabez had a city named after him. 
and 1 Chronicles 2.55, and it was a family of scribes that dwelt at Jabez, the Terathites, the Shimeites, and the Sukkothites. These are the Kenites that came out of, out of Hamath, the father of the house of Rechab. Well, Jeremiah, if we look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah says this lineage from Rechab, the Rechabites, they are blessed, you know, because they're faithful to God. See, way back then, God deemed that this Jabez, who, who was, was faithful all the way back through his lineage, that God was going to bless him. Blessings were already in his lineage. There's blessings that are in your lineage that you don't even know are there because you didn't know your, your predecessor. You don't, you don't know the mind of God, what blessings God has for you in store. But if we look at this, what really does the name of Othniel mean? It means a force of God. God took a man that was a nothing and a nobody. He showcased him in the Bible. He had a, he had a destiny that, mean, that meant pain and sorrow. And because he had a prayer life, because he decided to call on God, God made him a force of God. That means that man was a powerful, influential man. He had a life and a destiny that seemed irreversible. Am I talking to anybody here today? I would venture to say I am. God took him and made him a force for God. Because Jabez believed God. Would you believe God could do that in your life? I believe God can do that in your life, and I believe he will. But are you willing to seek him today? Are you willing to turn your life to Jesus Christ? Are you willing to get a deeper prayer life if you do know Jesus? Because you've, you've got to have that to make it. You've got to have that to be like him. You've got to have that to know him. And Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. In Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has a plan for your life regardless of your pain levels, regardless of your destiny, regardless of your heritage. God can do anything. And he wants you to know today that he will remove your pain. Matter of fact, a new destiny is waiting for you, a painless uh, destiny. Revelation 21 and 4, and the Bible says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Seek the Lord today, because God wants to change your life. In Jesus' name. <music>